three cats um, and one of them is very old and deaf and she's a bit senile and so she gets very confused and doesn't seem to know where she is and she cries and then we have to go and find her because she can't hear us calling her so if uh, I get called by my senile cat I might have to briefly pause and go and find her and bring her in but I think she's asleep so hopefully we won't have any feline interruptions but just warn you if I suddenly have to hear it will be brief and it will be cat based <laughs> hopefully that won't happen <laughs> so I will make a start and hopefully we'll be able to get through without her interruptions so Okay, so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to give a really brief introduction to um, queerness in the 18th century before we go into the 19th century because of the Gothic mode originating in the 18th century. Um, there's a really interesting relationship between how queerness was perceived then and the development of the Gothic mode. So I'm going to go a little bit into that so we can draw out that relationship a bit um, and then go into the 19th century. Um, I'm going to be talking through so the themes of religion, illness and empathy that we're going to be looking at and then I'm going to be looking at them in more depth through a reading of two stories by Vernon Lee. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to her and then to the stories for anyone who hasn't read them and then we'll go uh, a bit more in depth into the text. So uh, this is a quote from an anti-sodomy pamphlet um, that was written in England in the 18th century and there were so many of these produced um, that are all much of a muchness, but um, I find this one particularly interesting um, for lots of reasons, um, but for a few in particular that I'm going to draw out. Um, so this writer has written this fashion, and the fashion he's referring to is men kissing one another in public, and that's not necessarily romantic kissing, um, that, that's kissing on the cheek as a greeting, but even this was outrageous to him. So he says, this fashion was brought over from Italy, the mother and nurse of sodomy, where the master is oftener intriguing with his page than a fair lady. And not only in that country, but in France, which copies from them, the contagion is diversified. And the ladies and the nunneries are criminally amorous of each other in a method too gross for expression. So the first thing, and there's so much you could say about this quote, the first thing I find really interesting is that he refers to sodomy being brought over from Italy, uh, which he, he calls its mother and nurse. And then when he speaks about France, um, the women he's talking about are specifically nuns. Um, I find this really interesting because it shows that in the 18th century, there was this close association between sodomy and um, the Mediterranean and Catholicism in particular. Um, but Italy is obviously a, a very Catholic nation and was even more so then. Um, and then there's the reference to nunneries. So there's really interesting association in the English imagination there. The second thing I find interesting is that he refers to sodomy as a contagion. Um, so here we see, and this is something we'll bring out more when we look at the 19th century, um, we see an association between illness um, and sodomy and same-sex desire here. Um, but I think that the use of the word contagion is particularly interesting. It's not just illness, it's an infectious illness. Um, so what we see here is this association between sodomy with both this foreign, foreign nations and foreign religions and contagion is this idea that it's not just objectionable from a moral standpoint, but that it's actually dangerous to England as a nation state. Uh, which is a really interesting and um, depressing <laughs> idea, I think, but that's something that we'll look at more um, as we go into the 19th century. Uh, and lastly, that he refers to um, sexual interactions between women um, as taking place in a method too gross for expression. Um, so there's this idea of the unspeakable here. And what I find interesting about this is not just the repulsion towards it and, and the the reluctance to express it, but the fact that it really couldn't be articulated at all. Um, there was the, the word sodomy um, and sodomite, but that only referred to a particular sexual act that didn't even indicate sexuality. Obviously, great men can um, commit sodomy, to use 18th century phrasing as well. Um, and for women, there wasn't really any terminology at all. Uh, so it's really interesting that he, he's trying to express his outrage for something that he can't even really name. Um, and didn't want to name, but, but literally couldn't whether he wanted to or not. And the reason I find this so interesting is because of the relationship that then has with the Gothic. So 
This is one of my favourite quotes on the queer Gothic, and this is from George Haggerty, who wrote the book Queer Gothic. And he says that Gothic fiction offered the one semi-respectable area of literary endeavour in which modes of sexual and social transgression were discursively addressed on a regular basis, and therefore itself helped shape thinking about sexual matters, theories of sexuality, as it were. So what he's saying here is that because there was really nowhere else that transgressive sexuality was being addressed, Gothic fiction is basically all we have from the 18th century in terms of a, kind of a solid history of sexuality. Um, obviously, if we look at, at the text that we just looked at from the 18th century, we get an idea about people's feelings towards it, but it wasn't really an articulation. I mean, it, he says within the text that he can't articulate it. So Gothic fiction is really the only articulation that we have from this period, which I find really fascinating. Um, this is obviously quite a poor um, mode. Um, so Hafel Thomas, um, who wrote a book on queer others in the Victorian Gothic, says some authors employ Gothic frameworks to defend queer and other marginalised characters in ways that were quite subversive. For other authors, Gothic as a genre allowed them to express their ambivalence regarding others in society. So on the one hand, you have the fact that it allowed people to articulate these feelings and experiences they couldn't really articulate any other way. On the other hand, the fact that it's the Gothic, which is a mode obviously based on fear and monstrosity, meant that it, it had limitations on how positive it could be um, in terms of those representations. It's very hard to give a very liberating portrayal of an experience if you have to do so, so through metaphors of monstrosity. Um, so Ellis Hansen um, makes a, a kind of similar comment where he says, Gothic often reproduces the conventional paranoid structure of homophobia and other moral panic over sex, and yet it can also be a raucous site of sexual transgression and access that undermines its own narrative efforts at erotic containment. So what he's saying there is that, in a sense, it does, it does replicate those um, homophobic beliefs um, through those metaphors of monstrosity. Um, but the fact that it's representing it at all meant that those expressions of transgression couldn't really be contained um, by the conclusion of the text, um, which is referring to um, what Hughes and Smith describe um, as the fact that a fearful publishing industry demanded that these troubling things, so these expressions of queer identity, should be contained by the eventual triumph of a familiar morality. In consequence, the genre frequently espoused a characteristically conservative morality and frequently a conventional and rather public heterosexuality. So often at the end of Gothic texts, you'll have a marriage between heterosexual characters that kind of resolves the troubles that have come before, including these expressions of queerness. And whether that's because the writer actually was homophobic or because they felt that they were unable to express um, a, a queer narrative that kind of continued in, until the novel's conclusion in a positive way, um, obviously depends on the writer. Um, but I wanted to finish with that one for now because I think what's really interesting is the way that Lee kind of turns this on its head, which we'll look at in just a second. Um, but first, we'll look a little bit about queerness in the 19th century. So I'm using the term queerness here to describe kind of any um, deviation away from kind of normative ideas about gender and sexuality. Um, and the reason for using this kind of blanket term um, is partly because, as I said, um, there weren't really the same um, articulations of queer identity in the 18th century. And though things did progress in the 19th century, still nothing like um, we have today. Um, so I'm trying to avoid being anachronistic in using contemporary phrasing. Um, but also there was not the distinction in the 19th century, as we'll see in a second, between gender and sexuality uh, in the way that there is in contemporary thinking. Um, so here are a few of the terms used to describe um, same-sex desire in the 19th century. Uh, so the most popular one, um, the one that we see most often was invert. Um, and this differed quite significantly from the term sodomite in that it signified um, more of an identity rather than someone committing a particular act. Um, what's particularly interesting about it is that it was, was seen as a total reversal of the sexual role, as the, the name suggests. Um, so this was kind of bringing in pseudoscientific beliefs with the Victorians' interest in science, um, that someone who expressed 
desire for people of the same sex had in the womb developed traits of the other sex. So um, they saw men who were attracted to other men as um, having kind of developed female traits in the womb and vice versa, um, which is, is particularly interesting um, because it shows kind of this conception that still exists today, really, that what it means to be a man involves being attracted to women and what it means to be a woman involves being attracted to men we're seeing encoded in this word, which is very popular in the 19th century. Um, and as we can see, this kind of conflates um, gender and sexuality um, in quite a fascinating way. So another term was Uranian, uh, which was um, specifically used uh, to describe men who desired other men. Um, and it refers to a female psyche in a male body. So again, we have these kind of pseudoscientific ideas um, about sex and gender and sexuality. Um, that conflate a lot of the, the modern ideas we have about gender and sexuality into one, um, one experience as they understood it. So in a similar sense, we have the term third sex, um, which refer to men and women. Um, so I use those terms. The Victorians, with these views, um, some felt that if a woman desired another woman or a man desired another man, they, they couldn't be a man or a woman. They were an entirely different sex altogether. And again, this was based on these kind of pseudo-scientific pseudo beliefs um, about the development in the womb. Um, then these ones I find particularly interesting. So um, these terms, Omi Pallone and Pallone Omi, are uh, from Polaru, which is a form of Kant slang, uh, which was used at least as early as the 19th century uh, by various groups. And um, one of the groups of people who used it are what we would now term kind of gay circles, queer circles. Um, they're especially men. Um, what's interesting about these terms is that the term Omi um, is Polari for man and the term Polone is Polari for woman. So the first one here, Omi Polone, is the term for what we'd now call a gay man. It literally means man, woman. And the term Polone Omi is uh, the term for what we would now call a lesbian, um, but it literally means woman, man. So even people articulating their own experiences were seeing them in these terms of um, of this very binary way of thinking um, that conflated gender and sexuality. And lastly, uh, we have homosexual, um, which is one of the most pertinent to this discussion. Um, this term kind of came into use in England uh, at the end of the 19th century in around 1886, where Richard von Kraft Ebbing um, used it in his book, Psychopathia Sexualis. We didn't coin the term, but it was the first time it kind of became known in England. Um, but as you can imagine, um, this book divided opinion. Um, so it literally translates to sexual psychopathy. Um, so he characterized uh, sexual desire for uh, between men or between women as a pathology. And in some sense, um, some senses it was a positive in that he argued that it was natural and therefore it shouldn't be criminalized. But on the other hand, he was you know, characterizing it as an illness. So it wasn't um, an entirely sympathetic book. So for its time um, was radical in its thinking about uh, criminology. But in terms of kind of medical and scientific understandings of sexuality it was still quite progressive. So um, this is Vernon Lee. Um, so Vernon Lee uh, was born Violet Paget, which we'll go into a bit in a minute. Um, so Vernon Lee was the name that she went under, uh, which is obviously quite a masculine name. And as you can see from these pictures, a couple of photos and a painting by John Singer Sargent, who's a good friend of hers, um, she presented herself in a very masculine way. Um, she did occasionally um, in letters uh, use male pronouns, um, but the reason I'm, I'm referring to her as she is because that seems to be what she predominantly used. And it's very difficult to make uh, any claims about her identity because of we've seen um, 19th century conceptions of identity were very different to contemporary ones. So it's very difficult to um, identify her um, in any particular way because of um, that difference in identification. Um, but what we do know about her is that she was born in 1856 in France, had British parents. Um, spent most of her life in Italy. She lived all around the world, but Italy was where she spent the majority of her life. Um, so she did have three long-term relationships, which are all with women. Um, but her friends um, who wrote about her life um, 
unanimously said that they didn't think that these relationships were ever consummated and that they believed that she had kind of a moral um, dilemma over these relationships and over her own sexuality. Um, now obviously we'll never know, but that seems to be what the people closest to her believe. Um, so she wrote some non-fiction works on 18th century art and music in Italy, which really interested her and which came into her fiction, as we'll see in a bit. Uh, but she also wrote lots of Gothic short stories and novellas that divided opinion. So some people loved them and some people really hated them, including her friends. Like she was good friends with Henry James, who um, had some harsh opinions on some of her works. Um, she was considered a prominent member of the aesthetic movement and she associated with lots of the famous figures from the movement. Um, she was close to Walter Pater and she was also an acquaintance of Oscar Wilde. Um, she became, became renowned in those circles for her work on empathy. So before Vernon Lee, nobody really knew the term empathy. It was coined a few years before she started using it. It was her who really popularised the term. And she wrote a lot about empathy in relation to art. So she would conduct these experiments where she would take one of her partners to museums and art galleries and position her in front of artwork. And she would observe her movements in minute detail and then ask her to describe her feelings. And so she was really interested in empathy as a form of art criticism. Um, but as we'll see um, when we go into her stories, she also used empathy in the, term, the terms we usually use it in terms of empathy between people. Um, to explore queer identity in her stories. And she died in 1935 in Florence, which is where she spent. So uh, the first story that we're going to look at um, is one called A Wicked Voice, which was published in 1890. And A Wicked Voice is about a Norwegian composer called Magnus, who loves 18th century music, but hates singing passionately. Um, he knows a lot about 18th century music and he's visiting Venice. Um, he's staying in uh, what Van Lee describes as an artist boarding house. Um, he's trying to get some inspiration for an opera that he's working on. And another guest who's staying in the boarding house comes across uh, a painting of an 18th century composer. And he says to him, do you know who this is? Can you tell us anything about it? And he says that it's a composer and singer called Zaffarino, who uh, had a beautiful singing voice, but who was uh, nicknamed Zaffarino because he wore this sapphire gem which was believed to have been given to him by the devil and it's understood that the terms of this kind of relationship between them is that he has this incredible incredibly beautiful voice um, and had an extremely successful life but his voice um, has the capacity to make people ill to cure people or to kill people um, but Magnus has a really strange reaction to this portrait he becomes extremely angry um, but he also is obviously attracted to this portrait. So he has this real inner conflict, um, which is quite explicitly written, um, especially considering the time period. Uh, it's not very subtle at all that it's attraction that he's feeling, as we'll see. Um, and he ends up being haunted by this voice, which previously killed the great grand aunt of someone else who's staying in the boarding house with his voice. So um, it's interesting because it's this story of, of fear and of victimization but it's also one of um, very explicit desire which was unusual in the period so we'll look a bit more in depth at that in a moment. The other story uh, that we're going to look at is Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady which was published in 1896. Um, it was published in the Yellow Book which some of you might be familiar with, um, Oscar Wilde famously um, published in it and it was a very controversial um, publication at the time. And um, this is it's quite a convoluted story, but to describe it as succinctly as possible, um, it's about a prince called Albrecht who grows up in his grandfather's castle. They have a strange relationship, they don't really see each other. And in his room he has a tapestry, and in the centre of the tapestry is a knight um, with a beautiful woman. And he is enchanted uh, by this tapestry, he's obsessed with it. Um, but he can't see the full tapestry because in front of it is a chest of drawers with an enormous crucifix on it. Um, and that conceals the woman from the waist down. So he can't see anything of her um, up from below her waist. And he really wants to see it, but he can't move the chest of drawers. But when he's 11, his nursemaid decides it's time for him to move out of her room and into his own room and that she will replace um, her, his bed from her room with um, the chest of drawers. So she moves it. 
And when she moves out of the way, you can see that behind the crucifix, she has the snake of a tail, the body of a tail from the waist down. And this really enchants him. He becomes really obsessed with this history, but his um, grandfather replaces it with another painting. And he's so outraged by this that he cuts it into pieces and gets banished to the kingdom of his ancestor, who was also called Prince Alberic. There have been three Albericks and he's the third. And when he's there, he meets this very beautiful woman who visits him once a day, every day at the same hour, uh, and tells him that she's his godmother, but that he can't tell anyone, uh, and that she can't tell him her name. And um, all the rest of the time, um, he, his only real companion, there are some peasants that live there, but he doesn't really seem to have much of a relationship with them. Um, but he finds this grass snake that he owns. Um, but the, his godmother hates all mentions of snakes. Um, and one day this old man who often comes to the castle singing songs about the area's history comes and he decides to ask him about the story of Prince Albrecht and the snake lady as the first Prince Albrecht. Um, and at first the old man refuses, kind of threatens him and he gives in and so he tells him this story about um, this woman who was um, a fairy, but she was so beautiful that one of the other fairies who was jealous of her cursed her to live as a snake, um, unless a man was faithful to her for 10 years. Um, and the first Prince Albrecht is lured into this enchanted castle where um, he comes across this, um, this tomb, and on the tomb it says, um, whatever creature um, issues from this tomb, um, if you kiss it, Three, uh, three times um, you'll be rewarded so he goes um, to the tomb he calls it out and a snake emerges and he kisses the snake three times as instructed it turns into this beautiful woman um, and it turns out that this, um, this woman is his godmother and the grass snake in two different forms so she can only exist in her human form for one hour of each day um, so from that point, things kind of spiral, but we'll get into that in a bit more depth um, in a bit. But that's the basic premise of Prince Albert and the Snake Lady. So um, Catholicism uh, emerges as a, a principal theme in a lot of Gothic fiction, and it's really pertinent to these stories. So we'll begin by looking a bit at the relationship between Catholicism and the Gothic. So George Haggerty says, Catholicism emerges from the historical setting to play an active role in most Gothic novels. Uh, and he also goes on to say, Catholicism and transgressive sexuality were inextricably bound in the cultural imagination, a point where Gothic writers could titillate with the possibility of same-sex desire merely by evoking Catholicism. So there's a really clear link, as we saw in that text in the 18th century, um, between Catholicism and transgressive sexuality, and that played a major theme in the Gothic. So as we looked at a bit earlier, this is one of the ways in which the Gothic kind of filled those gaps in articulation in the 18th century, and this continued into the 19th century. Um, and Ruth Robbins, who's um, written on Lee, wrote that Italy carried implications of un-English and unmanly eroticism and exoticism. So again, we see that link between sexuality and nationhood. Um, it was seen as something um, that was not only um, a threat to morality, but actually a threat to the nation. So what's interesting then um, is that Lee sets lots of her stories in, in Italy, uh, which is obviously partly because she lived there, but the, the fact of her living there is interesting in itself. Um, so, Vanetta Colby, uh, one of her biographers, writes that Italy was a refuge and escape from what she perceived as the encroaching evils of modern society and an escape from her bondage as a woman. What you can also see through these associations, that it might have also been an escape from her bondage um, as a queer person. Um, it was seen as somewhere where expressions of queer sexuality were more acceptable. Um, and I think especially if you look at how people like Oscar Wilde were treated in England, um, it was literally safer for her, although as a woman she, she may not have been punished to the same degree because it wasn't a criminal offence. Um, it was regarded as a kind of impossibility instead. Um, but it was certainly safer um, on, on a more personal level um, rather than from, from the powers of the law. Um, and in terms of fiction as well, Hazel Thomas writes that it was a safe place to house queer stories so that from a distance, Lee could make her point and defend her queer comrades. Um, so 
again, we see a lot of distancing in Gothic fiction of things being set in different countries and in different time periods, kind of suggests that, yes, I'm discussing something transgressive, but it's not something that would happen here and that would happen now, um, which doesn't necessarily reflect the views of the writer. It might do, but in Lee's case, it seems much more likely that it, it is um, a kind of safety net that allowed her to articulate these desires and experiences um, from a safer perspective. So um, what I'm going to do from now on is quotes from Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady are going to be in green and quotes from A Wicked Voice are going to be in kind of goldy brown um, so that we can distinguish between the text without having to write them out every time. So this is the very beginning of Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady. Lee writes that in the year 1701, the Duchy of Luna became united to the Italian dominions of the Holy Roman Empire. So right from the very beginning, we have this association um, be between um, you know, the story that's about to be told with Italy and with Catholicism specifically, and also with the 18th century, um, where these, these associations were particularly, um, particularly concrete in the English imagination. So that gives us a really interesting starting point for the story. Um, a wicked voice kind of makes more of this setting in a way. So um, Lee writes, so a wicked voice is told as a kind of therapeutic confessional from Magnus. And he says that on the night he came across the picture, Venice seemed to swelter in the midst of the waters, exhaling like some great lily, mysterious influences, which make the brain swim and the heart faint, a moral malaria. So we already see this, this association here between um, Italy with illness, um, which, as we know, were both associated with sexuality. So we're already seeing those hints early on in the story and early on in the narrative of his association with Zaffirino. And after he sees this portrait of Zaffirino, one of the other members of the boarding house um, asks um, if he will play uh, one of Zaffirino's songs, and he responds very rudely and refuses, and he says that that's not like him. Um, and so when he's kind of defending himself to the reader, he says, um, how fearfully this cursed heat, these cursed moonlight nights must have unstrung me. This Venice would certainly kill me in the long run. So again, we see this association between Italy and danger. But what's interesting is that he then says, um, the sight of this idiotic engraving, the mere name of that coxcomb of a singer have made my heart beat and my limbs turn to water like a lovesick would you like? You see that what he's actually talking about isn't Venice itself, it's this, it's the portrait. And the fact that he uses the phrase lovesick is really interesting, firstly because he acknowledges desire, um, by which I mean Lee through him acknowledges that this desire uh, is present very explicitly, um, which was incredibly progressive for the time at which it was written. Um, but also the association of love and sickness um, in this transgressive context, as we know, kind of feeds in to contemporary ideas and also long-standing ideas in England about transgressive desire. Um, but of course, what Lee is describing is not actually sickness at all, you know, a beating heart and kind of water-like limbs um, are signifiers of desire and not of actual illness. So she kind of undermines that association, even as she writes it into Magnus, who has quite a complex relationship, as we'll see, with his desire for Zaffirino. So, um, to go a bit more into this association um, between illness and sexual dissidence in the 19th century, Joseph Bristow, who's a queer historian, writes that um, Wilde, Oscar Wilde, was indisputably a pathological figure, um, and also that the sexual criminal had transformed by degrees into something of a gothic character. So the idea of the sexual criminal at the end of the 19th century is kind of haunted by this image of Wilde. He became the kind of poster boy, um, and in the sense, um, it took on a kind of gothic narrative of its own, which I find really interesting. Um, and Wilde was very aware of this, and he wrote um, in his diaries, um, I am a pathological problem in the eyes of German scientists. Um, and so, um, in fact, in his letters, so he was expressing this to a friend, um, which I find really interesting because, in a sense, it could be said that those scientists were defending him, they were arguing against his criminalization. As you can see, they were arguing against it by claiming that he was ill, that there was something wrong with him, which was an idea that he rejected, and rightly so. Um, and we see this in the picture of Dorian Gray. So one of the most well-known quotations in the novel is the only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. And what he then goes on to say is, resist it and your soul grows sick with longing for the things it has forbidden to itself. 
with desire for its monstrous laws have made monstrous and unlawful. So he acknowledges this relationship between desire and sickness here, but he completely rejects the idea that they're inherently related. And instead, he argues that the sickness comes from the inability to indulge those desires, and especially um, with kind of legal restrictions, which he refers to as monstrous. Um, so again, this is a really progressive um, take on this association between illness and sexual dissonance, which Bernan Lee also utilizes in her work. So, in um, her diaries, she wrote, um, and this is about um, her kind of investigations um, into empathy, but these, as we've seen, she would conduct these experiments with her partner, were charged with a, an eroticism in themselves. So she asks, may there not at the bottom of this seemingly scientific, philanthropic, idealizing, decidedly noble looking nature of mine be something base, dangerous, disgraceful that is puzzling me? My be indulging a mere depraved appetite for the loathsome while I fancy that I am studying diseases and probing wounds for the sake of diminishing both, perhaps. So what we see there is that she kind of also acknowledges this association um, between sexual dissidence and illness. Um, and she contemplates whether there's anything in that, but she then goes on to say, um, which of these two, the prudes or the easy goers, are themselves normal, healthy? Oh? Wrong way forward. There we go. Um, so she's questioning that um, and questioning whether, in fact, it might be repression that's unhealthy. We see similar ideas to what Wilde was expressing there. And she also asks in one of her essays called Deterioration of the Soul Does society not produce its own degenerates and criminals, even as the body produces its own diseases or at least fosters them? So again, she's asking if perhaps the problem is in society rather than in herself and in others who feel the same way as her. So we also see this in her fiction. So um, Hazel Thomas writes about a trip that she took with John Singer Sargent to the Bologna Music School, um, where they saw this painting of an 18th century composer, that she and Sargent had both wished that they could hear the dead singer's voice, a voice that had historically been said to have curing properties. Um, and this is possibly the portrait that they saw, but we're, we're not entirely sure. Um, but that's really interesting because, as we've seen, that's kind of something that she brings into a wicked voice. Um, and as I mentioned, in a wicked voice, Saffarino has the power to make people unwell and even to kill them with his voice. But what's crucial about this is that it's not an automatic consequence of hearing his voice. It's something that he can choose to do. And the Procuratessa, um, which is the grand aunt of um, the other guest at the, the boarding house, um, the reason that she was killed by his voice is because she refused to believe that he could make any woman fall in love with him by singing, which he claimed to be able to do. And the reason that she refused to believe that um, was because she saw him as below her. She, she was a woman of rank and she refers to him as a lackey. And she takes this as a, an affront to her status. Um, and he's very upset about this. He's very proud of his voice. So he conceals himself in a crowd and sings in her presence and she becomes extremely ill. And the doctors sent for no one can really do anything. And it's decided that um, the only thing that they can do is invite him to sing for her. They've heard that his voice can heal people. Um, and when she finds out about this, she's very angry, but there's nothing she can do about it. So she, she has to receive him. Um, and he sings three airs. And um, by the second air, she's beginning to perk up. She seems almost restored to health. But during the third air, she immediately drops dead and he flees the country. Um, but what's crucial about this is that lots of other people hear his singing and aren't affected um, in such a way. They just think it's beautiful. So the thing that makes her ill and then kills her isn't, um, isn't, any, isn't desire for him, it's resistance to desire. Um, so again, we have this association being reversed in the way that we've seen in Wilde and in her own writings. Um, and in Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady, um, after he hears the song about the first Prince Albrecht and the Snake Lady, he becomes extremely ill. Um, and while he's ill, a priest visits him because they think it might be a case of demonic possession. And the priest is speaking with him. Um, and he kind of he's in this kind of trance-like fever pitch state for a few days. It's completely um, unable to communicate clearly. But after that, he kind of starts to come out of it. Um, 
and he manages to communicate with the priest um, and he's asking the priest um, if this story that he remembers hearing before he became ill actually happened or whether it was one of his hallucinations. And the priest thinks that he's still possessed, um, but it's trying to buy time before kind of a more senior priest can come and perform an exorcism by kind of humouring the demon. And so he answers his questions um, and he realises through the answers that he gets from the priest about this legend um, that his godmother um, is the snake lady and that his pet grass snake is her in her reptilian form. And he is overwhelmed with joy at this news. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that he already loved um, the snake lady as his godmother, but it's not suggested to be a romantic love or a sexual love, it's suggested to be kind of a platonic or familial love. Um, but after that, he becomes um, quite obviously attracted to her. So it's only when he realizes that she's this woman with the, the body of a snake from the waist down in the picture that he becomes attracted to her, which has some quite obviously um, phallic imagery, which while well, uh, Lee is not at all subtle about. Um, but what's interesting is that it's at this point um, that he recovers, that the priest says the demon has issued out of him. So it's completely reversing this association between transgressive desire um, and sickness and kind of an immoral um, position. So instead, um, he has a healthy response to developing this desire to the point where the priest thinks that he's cured. Um, and then Lee writes, his limbs seemed suddenly strong and his mind strangely clear as if his sickness had been a dream. So he's healed by this desire rather than sickened by it. And what's interesting about this is that the tapestry where he first saw the snake lady is described as being of old and gothic taste. And the reason that this is particularly interesting is because Lee wrote a lot about her um, experiments um, in terms of art and empathy, um, which Kathy Sommage has summed up here. Um, and she says that what Lee argues is that the human animal has a biological and a bodily need for art's healthful effect. We become the beautiful through perceiving the beautiful, and perhaps even more importantly, we become healthy. So, that given that that was her kind of understanding and one that was shared uh, by a lot of people in the aesthetic circle, the fact that he has a desire for this woman who he's seen in this tapestry um, is really interesting because again then she's reversing the association between transgression and sickness. Um, and it's especially interesting I think that it's a gothic tapestry. Um, she's really drawing the history of gothic's relationship with sexuality into this but in a much more positive way than it's otherwise been used. Um, so to speak a bit more about empathy in her stories, um, throughout um, A Wicked Voice, she makes lots of references to androgyny. So at the very beginning, when uh, Magnus is discussing his hatred of singing, um, he says that it merely stirs up the dregs of human nature, whereas music appeals to the soul. Um, and he talks about these dregs of human nature. Uh, he compares them to old paintings, um, he says they must be chained up as in old paintings you'd see um, angels um, chaining up demons and he refers to um, the demon that appears in these paintings as a demon with his woman's face. And then the rest are all descriptions of Zacharina. So he calls him an effeminate bow because he has a wicked woman's face, a man's voice that's had much of a woman's. But then he goes from using quite negative language to describe Zacharina to much more flattering language. So it's a sensual effeminate face that's almost beautiful. So we start to see here that he kind of becomes um, less resistant to his attraction to him as the story goes on. Um, and Zaffirino is such an obviously um, androgynous character that already makes the text um, deeply transgressive. But we see through empathy that Magnus himself um, then begins to take on um, some androgynous traits. So um, when um, the Procuratessa dies. She's described as turning fluid and vaporous. Um, oh no, sorry, um, he is described when he um, relives, so he relives her, um, her, her experiences first in a dream and then in reality he kind of experiences this, um, this reenactment and this is how he describes himself being, but he's earlier described by the Procuratessa as a vaporing great lady. So we see an identification with her there um, and he says as he relives it, um, that he knew that she was dying and that he was dying too. So he identifies with the Procuratessa in these moments. Um, so Patricia Pullen, um, who's written on the text, argues that Magnus is doubly feminized. 
His desire for a male singer cannot but be tinged with homoeroticism, and the fluidity of his orgasmic sensations ostensibly defines him as feminine. So Lee uses lots of language when she describes his encounters with Zaffirino, which are quite obviously um, orgasmic in nature, um, and fluidity was associated in this period with female sexuality. So we see that he's being turned himself into an androgynous figure here. But I'd argue that he's, he's triply feminized in that he also empathizes with this female figure. And so in this sense, Lee's kind of undermining this idea of male heterosexuality as this concrete, stable entity and force. Um, it all completely crumbles throughout the course of the story, which again is a really progressive um, idea, especially considering um, what was happening to people like Oscar Wilde, um, was about to happen to him um, at the time that she wrote the story. So, um, Emma Liggins argues um, of Prince Alberic that the feminine prince with his beautiful golden hair, love of reading and supposed proficiency and unmanly handicraft such as embroidery is a fit companion for the snake lady because of her shared gender indeterminacy. So, as we've said, the snake lady is, is transgressive in the sense of the kind of phallic imagery of this tale, um, which he's obviously attracted to. And Lee makes a point that he's not interested remotely in any other woman. Um, but he's also quite androgynous in himself. So he does have some masculine qualities. Um, he's um, interested in the military. He's described as appearing manly. But he also has this very beautiful, um, long golden hair, which looks like the snake ladies. Um, and there's this wonderful reference to him having proficiency in unmanly handicrafts. Um, so he's also um, an androgynous figure in this text. Um, and she also argues that he confirms his femininity by dying insane. So what happens um, after he's come to the realization of who the snake lady is, um, he's recalled back to the palace um, and he takes her with um, him as, as a, a grass snake. Um, and he's determined to stay faithful to her for 10 years so that she can turn back into a woman all the time. But what happens then is his grandfather realizes that he has no money um, and he wants to complete this tomb he's been making for himself. And he suddenly gets really worried that he's gonna die soon and it won't be complete. So he wants Albrecht to marry a woman of wealth to bring more money in so that he can finish this tomb. And Albrecht refuses and he can't explain why, um, but he refused to get married. Um, and so he's imprisoned eventually when everyone's tried everything they can think of to persuade him. And um, he's in there for six weeks and then his grandfather comes in with um, three of his courtiers and they try to persuade him once again. Um, but during this discussion, one of them spots um, the snake lady, but she's in grass snake form and she's just curled up asleep in the corner of the cell. Um, and they attack her. So the jester, with a blow of his harlequin's lap, crushed the head of this startled creature. Um, so she is kind of instantly uh, killed um, by the jester. Albert leaps to save her and he's too late. But what's really interesting is that even though um, you could argue that there's a homophobic element to the ending of this story where these kind of transgressive characters get this horrific ending, I think the tone that Lee, Lee uses is really interesting. So what she then writes is that Albrecht had thrown himself on the dead snake, which lay crushed and bleeding on the floor, and he moaned piteously. Three times he broke loose, three times he was recaptured, and finally bound and gagged and dragged away. So this kind of poignant description of his anguish and his abuse um, is, is quite moving. And in comparison, his grandfather responds um, by kicking its mangled head with his ribbon shoe. He turns away laughing. So we're obviously made here to sympathise with Alberic and with the snake lady rather than um, with the jester or with the grandfather. Um, so here, um, this kind of transgressive relationship between them, which is enhanced by the relationship with each other, you know, by, associating, by associating with each other, they become more transgressive. Um, but that's not seen as um, something negative. Um, it's punished, but Lee's focus is on the brutality of that punishment. She's not endorsing it in any way with the language that she uses. So much like Wilde, again, she's condemning the society that makes um, these relationships and these experiences forbidden rather than those experiences themselves. So um, to finish off, um, Theresa Godot um, is a Gothic scholar who uh, worked um, on various areas, um, uh, including the post-colonial Gothic. And she came up with this idea of haunting back, which is the idea that kind of marginalized groups um, 
who have been negatively represented in the Gothic can rewrite it themselves to tell their own stories and their own voices, which I think is really interesting here, because if we look at a couple more quotes on the queer Gothic, so Dale Townsend says, the queerness in early Gothic is consistently bound up in the problems of negative representation, as we've seen the fact that um, often there's this very kind of conventional ending, or that they're represented as monstrous, and although it provided space for articulation, um, it's also a, not an entirely positive or, or sometimes not at all positive representation. And George Haggerty also argues that Gothic fiction can be read as reinscribing the status quo. Gothic resolutions repeatedly insist on order stored and often on reassertion of heteronormative prerogative, but we don't see that here. So although we do see some issues of negative representation, so we don't get any happy endings, we also don't get any order restored, especially not in a heteronormative sense. So Prince Albert and Snake Lady end, um, end in tragedy. Um, as we've seen, um, they say that um, Prince Albert died insane, although they say that everyone around him said that um, he, he had his senses about him. So it seems as if he, he's died of a broken heart. Um, and his grandfather also dies. So interestingly, he does die insane. Um, and he also, there's an interesting relationship with his sexuality. We never hear anything about um, his, his grandmother. And at one point, Albert says, well, why don't you marry someone? Because um, he still looks very young and beautiful, uh, the grandfather, and he won't entertain that. So there's questions around his own sexuality. And um, he dies insane because he finds that when people were sent to clean up the dead snakes, they instead found this brutalized bo uh, body of a naked woman, um, which drove him insane. Um, and in a wicked voice, um, Magnus is kind of tortured because he survives this encounter with Beferino, but after that he never hears his voice again, and this is after being haunted by it for um, some time. And so he can never, it says he can never again lay hold of his inspiration, so his career is kind of ended by it, but he also longs to hear the voice again after so long despising singing and resisting, fiercely resisting this attraction. It ends with him being absolutely desperate to hear Beferino's voice again and begging him to let him hear it one more time. So although we don't necessarily get happy endings, we definitely get transgressive endings, um, which kind of reverse a lot of the kind of associations between Gothic um, and sexuality in the 19th century. So um, if anyone has any questions, um, then feel free to ask, or if there's anything that you'd like to share um, or to discuss, then please feel free to do so. Um, and I hope that that was enjoyable. Thank you very much. I'm just reading your comments. <laughs> it's fun, isn't it? When you, you get to the end of the lesson, you, you've seen them flashing up, but you can't see them when you're teaching. Yeah. <laughs> like, what have we been talking about? <laughs> oh, I wish I could have shown you the snake. <laughs> yeah, I had, I had a brief disturbance from the cat in question. He's come to join me now. Um, but hopefully that wasn't too distracting. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear her, she's very loud. No. <laughs> um, does anybody have uh, any questions? You can put them in the chat if you want to, or you can ask them uh, by video if you don't mind being on the YouTube video. Ah, mm. oh, so I've just seen that um, question from Louisa. Yes, yeah, so um, there's a really good essay called The Castrato and the Cry, which is um, about that. It's about, um, the castrati in um, a wicked voice and yeah it's really interesting um oh there's a link to it in my bibliography which is going to be going up um it's well worth a read um and it talks about um this this relationship between the castrati which if, if anyone doesn't know um it's kind of a a, a style of uh, an androgynous kind of style of scene associated with with um young boys but that was was feminine um and at one point um she she doesn't actually describe Zafrin as a castrati, but she she describes him in those terms. So she talks about how his voice had much of a woman's and um, how it had like qualities of youth. Um, but we don't actually ever know his actual age. Um, so I mean, obviously he's long dead at the point that the story is taking place. Um, but yeah, so she's she's evoking those associations. Um, and the yeah, painting, that's well worth the a read. Painting, the painting reminded me very much of the the few paintings that we have of the famous castrati and i know that um 
I'm a retired opera singer and I teach a course on music in the Regency era in England. And the English reaction, the, pu the reaction of the English aristocracy to the castrati that came over um, was one of, of horror and fascination. So I wondered, um, I'm sure Vernon Lee would have known that. And I just wondered what the, uh, and, and if you've never heard a genuine castrati, there's only one recording of a genuine castrati singing, um, but there are countertenors. It is one of the most haunting sounds, um, but it is incredibly beautiful. And I could understand why someone who heard it might think that it had magical powers, but the sacrifices these young boys made, um, they were literally, at, before their voice changed, they were castrated which resulted in, um, they were very uh, broad chested um, and actually most of them were believed to be kind of hypersexual, which of course horrified the British even more. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but, but many of them were, um, many of them were straight, some of them were gay and some of them were bisexual, um, which horrified the British public even yeah. more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I was just curious as to, I've never heard of the story, I can't wait to read it, but I was curious as to whether that was something that played into it, this idea of the horror of the British public about these castrati that were were coming over in the 18th century. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you said about the kind of horror and fascination really characterizes the story. Um, but what's interesting is, I mean, Lee was definitely influenced, um, definitely influenced by that. Um, but what's quite interesting is that there is one scene. Um, so what's quite interesting is that in a lot of stories, you know, just one person will be haunted and, and you're not quite sure whether it's madness or not, but everyone hears Zaffirino when he's haunting him. So there's a scene where he goes out on a boat, um, on a gondola, and he hears his voice, but everyone around him hears it and they're applauding. Um, and then there's this big discussion between people about whether it was a man or a woman. But um, this is in Venice and there's no repulsion at all. Everyone's completely enchanted by it, um, which is really interesting. So Lee obviously had a much higher opinion um, of Italians than of, of Brits. Um, and she had quite an ambivalent relationship with Catholicism, which is, is interesting because you know, she was, um, interesting what she hated about Catholicism was that she considered it too otherworldly. Um, so her, that her interests themselves were quite otherworldly. Um, but, um, she obviously was able to overlook that in a way that a lot of Gothic writers weren't in this interest in Italy. Um, and yeah, that's a really interesting connection. I think the fact that no one except Magnus um, experiences any horror towards him, and, and Magnus isn't horrified by his voice at all, um, it, it's by his own feelings that horrify him. Um, so I'll, I'll um, direct you to the, when I put up my bibliography to the essay, it's really worth reading, it's really fascinating, um, and looks into um, the history that you're talking about there and Lee's relationship with it. Yeah, there's definitely, definitely a connection that's really interesting. Well, and, and the Catholic, the Catholic Church was responsible for the, for the production, for lack of a better term, of most of the castrati because they came out of the cathedral churches. Yeah. And, and these families literally sold their sons into this if they had a good voice in the hope that they would become a famous opera singer and pull the family out of poverty. Yeah. And I think especially that, that that has an interesting relationship then with that association between Catholicism and sexuality, um, especially with the kind of possibly unexpected hypersexuality that you're referring to. I think it's, yeah, it's a really interesting connection. Um, you'll definitely enjoy the article. It articulates it with much more knowledge of opera than I have. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's a really interesting link. Thank you. That was a really good question. Um, and Isabel said, um, it's interesting to see a possible link between the kill your gaze trope in mid 20th century publishing and movies and up to today uh, where you can get a queer storyline but happy endings are hard to come by yeah um it, it's definitely an interesting connection um and you know it, it's complex because you do get a, a very unhappy ending especially in prince albert and the snake lady it's tragic and it, it's quite traumatic um but it is difficult because of the, the time period um whether or not she could have given it a happy ending, like the first kind of gay happy ending in, in English fiction is Ian Forster's Maurice, which wasn't published until 1970. So she was well ahead of her time in, in siding with them in the unhappy endings um, and in the fact that the unhappy endings were kind of stigmatizing society rather than 
than those people expressing those desires themselves. Um, so it is difficult. I mean, it's hard reading in some respects, but it's it's certainly progressive for the time it was written in. Um, so on a related note, um, Millie says, would you say that the choice to end with a tragic death is a way to break away from this idea that all should end in heteronormative marriage? Sort of a resistance to that formula like ending. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I think the fact that he dies of a broken heart um, after losing her, are, rather than, than going through with this marriage, um, is definitely a way to break away from that. And also means that it ends with his grandfather um, dying and never getting his tomb completed. Um, and that seems like some sort of resistance in itself, um, that he he never gets what he wanted um, from Alberic, and he kind of becomes symbolic of this punishing transgression in the story, which is particularly interesting given the hints that his own sexuality um, might not be entirely normative. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that was a, a way of finally kind of um, moving away from those kind of very formulaic endings that were especially associated with with expressions of queerness in the Gothic. Um, oh, thank you so much, everyone. That's very nice of you. Um, I got some messages that were sent to me privately for you, Bronte, I think. Okay. <laughs> Which they were just, uh, not just, but they were saying that they really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, it wasn't thank a question, you. but I thought I'd share because I think it got missed. Oh, thank you um, very much. Um, thank you so much. Does anybody else have um, another ending? Oh, Louisa, the, men the one she mentioned was Maurice by Forrester. Yeah, yeah so he wrote that um, at the, the turn of the 20th century, but he didn't publish it in his lifetime. Um, it was published in 1970, but um, it was a, an early 20th century work. Um, it's lovely. It's much more cheerful than Van and Lee's stories. <laughs> but I would say not quite as interesting. But um, if you need cheering up after that. <laughs> It's been a while since I read it. I'm teaching a course on writing on Regency, gay life in Regency England for romance writers in order to encourage them to write Regency romances with gay characters and give them a happy ending. Yeah. Um, because the thought is that in, in the Regency era, if you were gay, you ended up getting hanged. And there's yeah. no happy ending for anybody except the hangman in that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm in teaching the course, I would love to be able to, to show them how long it took for a happy ending to show up. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's depressing how long it did take. Um, um, but I think you're absolutely right. And I think, um, obviously, there were, you know, people talk about um, whether or not it would be historically accurate. But of course, there were people who lived happy lives. You know, it m might have been much harder for them than it would be now. And, and obviously, it's not easy now for lots of people. But it happened. And, um, I mentioned it earlier because I just love it. I don't know if anyone saw Gentleman Jack about um, Anne Lister, um, which, which is quite lovely. She she had the first gay marriage um, in England, um, which was obviously not what, legally sanctioned, but she had the ceremony. Um, it wasn't an entirely happy marriage, but um, she did have various relationships um, in her life. So it just shows that you know, these, these relationships were happening. Um, they weren't always ending in, in violent death, <laughs> which is a nice reminder, I think. It's quite depressing to look back at history and, and see that as the only possible future for yourself. So um, I think it's really important. And um, yeah, Maurice is a, a lovely, lovely book. Mm. I think, Florian, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Mm, yes, um, about uh, Catholicism and sexuality and also I think someone said something else that I was like oh that's that kind of ties because I was thinking about it and then uh, yeah and tragic deaths in gay media um I've been doing a lot of research into Saint Sebastian as a homo homoerotic icon recently um because i'm doing a project about the aids crisis um it would be take a long time to explain the link between that, Is it alan so hollinghurst? that. huh uh, are you writing about alan hollinghurst uh no uh oh, i look that up he um, really... he wrote a book um he's a contemporary writer he, he wrote a book in the 80s called the swimming pool library um which okay. is a, a book about gay life but saint sebastian plays um a significant role in the book. So I think that would interest you. Um, but sorry, go on. 
Um, yeah, I think uh, what I'm interested in is the kind of trope of martyrdom mm. in homosexuality in media. So yeah. I wondered if there's a lot of that in Gothic. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and in kind of in, in Vernonly as well. Um, Magnus, uh, sorry, not Magnus. Prince Albert tries to kind of um, get in the way um, and to protect the Snake Lady. But definitely, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the film The Celluloid Closet, um, which is about the history yeah. of. Um, queer representation on film and there's one part that's really depressing um, where they show this um, montage of queer deaths on screen and I always find this really interesting because a lot of them are from gothic films and from adaptations of gothic novels um, and there, there's definitely a theme um, of martyrdom that, that appears in, in various gothic texts um, which I think again is a way of dealing with the fact that it was very difficult for them to give transgressive characters a happy ending um, but at the same time um, you know they don't want to give in to these kind of very conventional structures um, so I think like coming back to the ending of Prince Albert and the Snake Lady that that's that's a really good example um, yeah that definitely definitely um, appears in other texts and I think you would find Alan Hoynhurst really interesting because he writes a lot about queer literary history um, and the influence it has on the queer present. Um, he's wrote another wonderful book called The Line of Beauty, um, and it's set during the AIDS crisis, and there's this tension between um, this couple um, where one of them thinks that the other one is much too involved in their kind of literary past to be actively involved in the threats of the present. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think in terms of the Gothic, um, it is something that we see, and I think, um, especially with the, all of the Catholic imagery of Prince Albert and the Snake Lady with the serpent um, and um, all of this very kind of, um, it describes like the, the, the lands that the kingdom's in and it's very Garden of Eden-esque. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good example. Um, and when I post my bibliography, um, there's some writings in there that I think you'll find really interesting that go into the um, relationship between Catholicism and the Gothic um, in more detail, which I think you find really interesting. Yeah, look at your bib 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 ah, bibliography. <laughs> so, my, my <laughs> okay, really tongue tied now. Yeah, um, yeah. I look. I've looked up Alan Hollinghurst as well. That looks really interesting. He's wonderful, but, but don't his, his books are extremely explicit. So <laughs> lockdown's the perfect time to read them. I've been reading them on public transport before. <laughs> 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 my work is incredibly explicit at the moment. I've seen some things I didn't want to see. <laughs> I just saw what Millie said. Um, that sounds really interesting. I haven't read that that text. Um, so that sounds really good. I'll have to look that up. Thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, same. Um, so thank you very much to Bronte for doing this uh, talk for us and thank you to everybody that came. That's amazing. Um, some things came out this morning. So some things that Bronte talked about in the 19th century in some of the earlier classes in Romancing the Gothic, we've touched on them um, about homosexuality and its representation in queer Gothic in the 18th century. So I actually did the timestamps. <laughs> if you're interested <laughs> in a queer theology of the vampire in the Gothic text and you weren't in that lecture, um, if you look on my YouTube channel, the vampire lecture at one hour and 45 minutes starts to talk about uh, heretical infection and goes on to talk about queer theologies of uh, the vampire and in the one about gothic faith and monstrous religion at about 14 minutes in um, i start to talk about um anti-clerical and anti-catholic pornography from france <laughs> in the 18th century so happy days <laughs> um so if any of that's interesting to you um also, Bronte um, this morning did it and will probably do it again for you now. She, she's got some published work out so that you can, um, I'll retweet it so that you can uh, keep your eye on that. Um, if you're interested in finding about more about what she's working on and what she's doing. Um, if you'd remember it as well, like if you weren't here at the beginning and you want to be able to support Bronte, then her Kofi is there again in the chat. Um, feel free to contact her presumably on Twitter with a question. Um, if you have things that are left over and I'll be putting a video of this up tomorrow so if you if you didn't take all the notes that you want don't fear 
it will be going up online and I will also be, Bronte and I'll be putting up the slides and the um, bibliography. Um, thank you so much for coming and thank you again Holly for hosting. I've really enjoyed it. I've got two of my three cats with me now. <laughs> nice. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and thank you for putting up with the, the feline based distractions. <laughs> it was an adventure. I was excited about what we were going to see when we, <laughs> we set up. <laughs> yeah, she was shouting outside my door, so I had to go and wave to her for a minute. <laughs> she was facing the other way and can barely hear at all. But hopefully that wasn't too distracting. <laughs> um, if you, if, uh, no, it's fine. If anybody wants to come to a Sunday Gothics for the next week or a week after and you've not signed up, we're doing Twilight next week with Kaya Frank, who's always a treat to see if you've not seen her speak. She's very, very fun and very interesting and has very strong opinions. <laughs> Definitely about Twilight. <laughs> um, and the week after that, uh, one of our regulars, Mason, is going to be talking about trans narratives in Hannibal. So if you're interested in the queer Gothic and queer horror, um, that's going to be a really interesting chat. So just contact me if you haven't got the links for anything. Thank you again to Bronte. Thank you again to everybody. And we'll say goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bronte. Bye. Bye-bye.